Good morning. Welcome back. We are now at Mark chapter 7. Indeed, we have covered uh, quite a bit, even in this gospel according to Mark. And it is very, uh, I mean, it's much simpler than when we did in the gospel according to Matthew. And I'm so glad there are four of them who captured the life, the ministry of our Lord Jesus, because then we will get the complete picture of what our Lord Jesus did during His time here on earth. And so we continue our journey, and now we are in chapter 7. And there are two main sections here, namely true purity from verse 1 to 23. And then we have uh, the second section, Gentiles believe, verses 24 to 37. And under the subsection of the first section, uh, I will cover them shortly, the accusation, the condemnation, the declaration and explanation. And for the two subsections under the second part, uh, it will be casting out a demon and healing a deaf and mute man. So all this you can find on the slide before you on the screen. So Father, once again, we give you thanks. We, we bless your holy name. Indeed, you are awesome. You are amazing. You are great. You are wonderful. Lord, that you have this word preserved for us, for our edification. And so once again, we ask, dear Lord, help us to incline our ears to your wisdom this morning and fill our hearts with understanding that through this, we will find application even in our walk of faith with you. So Holy Spirit, do your work in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Looking at chapter 7, if you recall, uh, last week when we ended in chapter 6, Jesus and his disciples returned to Genesaret. And there at Genesaret, many, many, as touch him, were made well. They were made whole. So now, in chapter 7, verse 1 to verse 5, we find the accusation. The accusation by the Pharisees. The accusation by the Pharisees against Jesus' disciples. They wanted to discredit Jesus by the conduct of his followers. So let's read. <clears throat> then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now, I'm sure by now you know quite well who the Pharisees were, they, they were the re religious policemen, so to speak. They considered themselves the consecrated ones. They are the defenders of the Jewish way of life. They are so legalistic. Then we have the scribes. These are the professional expounders of the word of God. You might say they are hair splitters. They, they really manage and master the micros. Uh, they, go, they go into details and so on. But here on this occasion, they came all the way from Jerusalem, which is in the south. And if you look at the map, so they came all the way, 70 miles from Jerusalem, and they came all the way to where Jesus was in this area. And they came not with the intention of learning, they came with the intention of trapping Jesus, trying to uh, spy on him. And basically, they were jealous of his, uh, for his popularity. And definitely, they were openly hostile to Jesus and his ministry and the disciples as well. So, this was also the occasion as we have studied uh, in the last chapter, the disciples were sent out by Jesus on a mission and then they came back. And even in Mark chapter 6, verse 30, after they returned, they gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. 
And so, on the back of this successful mission, they were with Jesus. And here came the party poopers, you know. Here come all this kill joy, the Pharisees and the scribes. And they just wanted to find fault. Verse 2. Now, when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they, find, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Then the Pharisees and scribes ask him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? So, yes, here they are, the verses on screen. Now, Indeed, what we see here are fruits of envy inherent in the Pharisees and the scribe. They just look at the donut. They do not see the door, but they keep seeing the hole. And they always look for the negatives and they want to criticize. And so here, they were standing on ceremonial religiosity because their people, according to the tradition of the elders, they wash their hands. And you know, they go through a very dedicated process and very, uh, 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 what shall I say, it, it, they, they really follow a procedure. And I've seen them when, when I was in Israel. So water, the, the, the two hands are held up and uh, water is poured down from the palms from the fingertips down to the palms and down to the elbows, even as they are vertical. And then they are washed. The, the two palms will come together, uh, forming a feast, and they rub the feast against one another, each other. And then they invert their hands vertically, now with the elbows up and, and the palms pointing down so that the water will now drip down towards their fingertips and drip off. And that was their, their, their way of <coughs> cleansing even before they had their meal. But here came the disciples. They ate bread with unwashed hands. And for this, the Pharisees found fault with them. For the Pharisees, verse 3, and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way. And this special way was holding the tradition of the elders. This special way, as I just described to you, was not dictated, was not in the word of God. This was just added by the elders. And they imposed this on the people. For they deem that coming from the marketplace, it is unclean and they should wash their hands uh, before they eat. Fine, fine. There is a reason for hygiene. Yes. But we shall look at this later. Is the external more important than the internal? And not just the washing of hands. There are many things which they have received from the elders and they hold them dearly and this were this include the washing of cups and pitchers and copper vessels and couches this to them it, it was likened to baptizing these articles these items consecrate them for the use uh, for the service unto the lord and even by the jews but this were not dictated in the word of god but that's what they are their, 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 their practice was and that's what their teaching was and they deemed these Pharisees and scribes they deemed the tradition of the elders as the fence of the law so this tradition is a fence that guard the law so the tradition protects the law from being abused 
Or should it be the other way around? Shouldn't it be that the law will defend the people, will defend their practices and not the tradition defending the law? But that's how warped they were. They reversed the thing, thinking and preaching and practicing that the tradition shall be the fans of the law and shall defend the people. And this added to the burdens, surely. So we look at uh, this in Matthew 23, verse 4. For they bind, these are the Pharisees and the scribes, for they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do is to be seen by men and so on, which we have covered when we studied Matthew. So such were the Pharisees and the scribes, adding burdens to the people. We look at one more, Galatians chapter 5. And you see, they, they, they were truly not loving their neighbours. If I can read, uh, even from verse 13, Galatians 5. Paul wrote, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Through love serve one another. Surely the Pharisees and the scribes were not doing this. Verse 14, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. All the commandments narrowed down to just one word, love. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. And that's what the Pharisees and scribes uh, were doing. They specialized in this. They bite and they devour one another. And in so doing, consume one another. And it is so, so sad. So verse 5, Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? So their pride took over. And in so doing, they re they, the consequence was religious isolation. They were isolated from the rest of the people because they are the separated ones. And here, there is this person called Jesus and they resented him because they felt that their authority had been challenged. Jesus' popularity had challenged their authority. So, they sought to find fault with Jesus. And I'd like you to look at um, Exodus chapter 30, verse 19. Exodus 30, Verse 19. Maybe we can even look at this verse. Now, in the Old Testament, there was a place for washing. If you remember when we studied the tabernacle, the construction of the tabernacle, after you pass the first gate, there is the altar, the bronze altar where the sacrifice was burned and offered unto the Lord. Then we have the basin, the bronze basin. This basin of water was meant for cleansing, that the priests ought to be cleansed even before they step into the, past the second door, into the holy place, into the place where they will serve the Lord. And so in Leviticus, the, the, the priests, the, the high priests, they, they were cleansed even before getting into service unto the Holy God. And in Exodus 30 verse, let me read from verse 17. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, You shall also make a laver of bronze with its base also of bronze for washing. Bronze is the color of judgment. For washing, you shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it 
For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet in water from it when they go into the tabernacle of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord they shall wash with water lest they die so they shall wash their hands and their feet lest they die and it shall be a statute forever to them to him and his descendants throughout his generation so for the descendants as as the law has stated as a principle that it meant that the sinner be cleansed before enjoying the fellowship with the holy god even as they partake of the food yes that is very very good but to to insist on this alone of the external but not knowing what is in the internal of each and every one of this then it is not exactly it is not exactly god's intention and here the pharisees we have read and we shall see further that the pharisees has replaced the word of god with tradition so they just emphasize on tradition so people just do the thing but not knowing god's intent so verse 1 to 5 and those were the accusation of the pharisees against the disciples of jesus now we come to condemnation from verse 6 to verse 13 jesus condemned them he answered and said to them well did Isaiah prophesies of you hypocrites as it is written. We all know by now, hypocrites are play actors. In the days of old, these were actors and they put on a mask and when they go on stage and they were not playing themselves, they were playing the, the role of someone else. And so they were always play acting. They were pretenders. As we read just now, they were legalists. They get others to do, but they themselves would not do. So Jesus called them hypocrites. In fact, uh, all in all, Jesus uh, placed seven charges, made seven charges against them. The first charge was, he said, you are hypocrites. So, well, the Isaiah prophesies of you hypocrites as it is written. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts, their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So, even as Jesus quoted from Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13, there were more charges coming their way. So the first charge was first accusation, you are hypocrites. Second accusation. These people, these people referring to the Jews, they honor, these people honors me with their lips. Only lip service. Nothing from the heart, but it's just lip service. It is external. But their heart, their lips is external. But their heart, heart is internal. Their heart is far from me. You notice their heart, not their hearts, because Jesus categorized them collectively as one. These people, their heart is far from me. Isaiah 29 verse 13. Third charge, and in vain they worship me. In vain they worship me because there is no relationship. They were just going through the motion so whatever whatever they sought to do in worshiping ascribing praises and blessing and power and honor unto the the lord they achieved nothing it was a fruitless exercise so the third charge was in vain they worshiped god the fourth charge teaching as doctrines the commandments of men so instead of teaching the word of god they were teaching the commandments of men. And many times they quoted on, oh, this rabbi say this, this rabbi say this, that rabbi say that. And they were following the rabbi, making the rabbi's words 
a replacement for the Word of God. And we do have, even today, people who are preaching politics, preaching current events, preaching from books, Christian books, but not preaching from the Bible. Perhaps they use one or two verses just to support. But it should be the other way around. The Bible should be the main course and the rest will be used to supplement. So anyway, the fourth charge unto them was teaching the doct- as doctrines the commandments of men, not God's. Verse 8, For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and, and cups, as many other such things you do. Why? Because this was not commanded in the word of God. This was just the tradition of men. So this is the fifth charge. Laying aside the commandment of God. So, they just put it aside. Just ignore it. Just put it and we focus on the tradition of men. Washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. The sixth charge we find in verse 9. And he said to them, All too well you reject. Now this is more serious. Then, laying aside, laying aside, it is still there, but you are just not using it. But rejecting means you turn your back to the Word of God. You reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, and so Jesus gave an example, an example which probably was so prevalent then, because the, the, the aged parents were neglected. Uh, with this simple excuse called Koban. Koban means consecrated to the Lord. And so this, you know, as we have studied in the past, God is the first person. He was the one who initiated social welfare. He cared for the stranger in the land, the poor, the widow, the, 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 the orphans, the oppressed. He cared for them. That was social welfare. And for aged parents, they were supposed to honour their parents. This was the fifth commandment in the Ten Commandments. But as these people age, their children found an excuse, holding on to the tradition of men, rejecting the word of God, which insists and commanded that they honour their parents financially when they are old, Personally, when they are old, but they said, all these young men, all that I have, have been consecrated to God. Koban, Koban, Koban. And so because they are consecrated to God, Daddy, Mommy, I can't use them to support you. But these are only dedicated to God verbally. But in practice, they may not give it to the temple. And many have chosen, as history shows us, and many have chosen to use it for their own needs. So, giving a verbal excuse, denying and twisting themselves out of this responsibility to their aged parents, they then use the money for themselves. And Jesus gave this example. Because they reject the commandment of God that they may keep the tradition, their tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother and when and he and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. So in verse 10, Honor your father and mother. You can find this in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. That is the list of 10 commandments. And then the next one, which is, He who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. That is found in Exodus 21, verse 17. Whatever, next we read, Whatever profit you might have received from me, this is what the son says, Whatever profit which you might have received from me is Koban. Koban, I have dedicated to God. 
That is a gift to God. And mind you, again, I said it was twisted to avoid financial responsibility by this unfilial son. Then, you no longer let him, so he held the leaders, the religious leaders, he held the Pharisees and the scribes responsible because of your tradition. This young man is not going to uh, support his parents, honour his parents. Then you no longer, again charging this, this uh, Pharisees and scribes, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother. Verse 13, and this is the seventh charge. Making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. Verse 13 again, the seventh charge. You have robbed the word of God of its power by making the word of God of no effect you are robbing the word of God of its power. So there you have it, the seven charges. Jesus called them hypocrites, that they honour him uh, with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. That is the second charge. The third charge is in, in vain they worship him. The fourth charge is teaching the doctrines as commandments of men. Fifth charge is laying aside the commandment. Sixth charge is rejecting the commandment. The seventh charge is making the word of God of no effect. So, verse 14. And, and, even, and even as we, we, we look at this, you see, these traditions were intended, or maybe I wouldn't say intended, but in so doing, in adhering to these traditions, the consequence of which was the breaking of God's law. And this was not Jesus' purpose. Jesus came, if Jesus uh, sided with them, if Jesus agreed with this Pharisees and scribes, then means the, the, the law of God is broken. But Jesus said from onset, He came not to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. And so, now we come to verse 14. So he now declared to the multitudes, because there are others around, so they need to be told. So in verse 14 to verse 16, he de declared to the multitude. Verse 14. When he had called all the multitudes, so let's go back to Here, when he had called all the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. Remember a couple of chapters back, the lesson was hear and understand. Don't just let anything that comes through your left ear go out to the right ear, and, and nothing is retained. So all that you hear, seek understanding. Because faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. So you hear and you must understand. And if you don't, ask. It is so simple. If you don't ask, the disciples do that often. When they don't understand, they ask. We will read this in verse 17. So hear me, everyone. So that is a personal responsibility. You and you and you and everyone who is listening to this lesson. Hear the word of God. And understand, there is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Let him hear and understand. So if you have a year, if you have years, I mean, sorry, hear and understand. Stand. So there is nothing that enters a man. So this is physical. Nothing physical that enters a man from outside which can defile him. You know, when they hear this, suddenly their world is shaken, especially that of the Pharisees and the scribes. So by 
Jesus saying this, it means what is the difference between clean food and unclean food? Because they read in the law, they read in the law, eh, some food can eat, some food cannot eat. Some food are clean, some food are not clean. But what Jesus is now saying, there is nothing that enters a man from outside. So did not say clean or unclean, which can defile him. So nothing can defile him spiritually. But the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. So we shall see as we continue that the source of holiness is from within, inside. As Jesus hinted here, the source of holiness is from inside, not from outside, not without, but within. So it is a matter of the heart. It is a heart problem. In the next few verses, we will reveal the rest to us. It is a heart problem, a matter of the heart. So before we go further, let me, let me point you to one more. Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. Let's read from verse 8. And Jeremiah verse, uh, this chapter 7 is about trusting in lying words. So let me read from verse 8. Jeremiah wrote the word of God. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you still murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know? And then come and stand before me in this house, in the house of God, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all this abominations. What are you saying? You're saying that we have been saved so that we can do all this abomination. We can continue to steal, to murder, to commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense, to buy or walk after other gods. Has this house, verse 11, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it. God has seen the hypocrisy in the lives of these Jews back in the days of Jeremiah. When they come to the temple, they come to worship him and everything is hallelujah and great and glorious. But when they step away from that, they went on with abominations. And then, here, this practice has been replicated even in the days of these Pharisees and scribes. Because what they speak and what they do, they are totally different things. What they declare before God and what they practice, they are two different things. And God and Jesus here was pointing to them the source of the problem. It is the heart. It is the heart. So if anyone has ears to hear, let him, let him hear. So verse 17, back to Matthew. So earlier they were out, outside and Jesus called the multitudes together and told them, it is from the inside, the source of the problem. And when he had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable, the parable which was mentioned in verse 15. So he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Are you without discernment also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him because it does not enter his heart but his stomach and is eliminated thus purifying all foods food as we consume ends up in the stomach 
and the good stuff, the nutrients and all those stay. And what is discharged and disposed? Those are the ways. Those are not wanted by the body. So the food that went in, they have been purified. So food ends up in the stomach. But sin begins in the heart. Sin begins in the heart. And we look at Genesis. I mean, it started even, it was mentioned. I mean, we all think that uh, the heart no, the heart is somewhere on the left side of your chest. Yeah. Then what does the thinking is that grey matter between your ears called the brain, you know, the mind. But we read, and I think I mentioned this a few lessons ago, that the heart, the heart is the center of one's being. Uh, it is about your mind, it is about your emotion, it is about your will. It is the seat of human motives your thinking and everything. That is the heart. It is not the grey matter between your ears. And what did the Bible say? In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, God was very displeased with the wickedness that He saw in men on earth. Thus the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And this was before, this was before he flooded the earth with water, you know, Noah's Ark. So let's read. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent, every intent of the thoughts of his heart. Eh? Your heart can think. And what is your heart thinking? Evil. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So, back to verse 5. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil. The Bible tells us the heart was thinking. The thoughts of the heart was only evil. So it arises from the heart. This is the source. We look at one more, Proverbs 23, verse 7. And Proverbs has it for us, verse 7, for as he thinks in his heart, the Bible did not say as he thinks in his mind, as he thinks in his brain, but as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. So, as he thinks, things in his heart. So I, I brought these two verses to you so that you, you know now that the, the source of holiness is from the heart. The source of sin and evil intent is also of the heart, from the heart. So let me read again. Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart. It goes but his stomach. But his stomach and is and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. Verse 20. And he said, What comes out of a man that defiles a man for within, for from within? Out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, which we just read. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5, Pro uh, Proverbs 23 verse 7. For out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. All this, not some, all these evil things come from within the heart and defile a man. So, but what comes out from the heart can also be good. 
and it's intended to be good. And you find this in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Because the source is the heart. But unfortunately, evil comes forth. But God intended it to be good. That out of the heart comes praise and worship unto Him. And this you find in Deuteronomy chapter 6. It was commanded. Okay? Uh, recorded by Moses for us. But God's word is, Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love. So, you shall is a command. The people of Israel, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And that was commanded. And we jump to, you can read on further, but we jump to Chapter 10, uh, verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, to love Him, to serve Him, your, the Lord your God, with all your heart and with all your soul. I thought to serve him is with my hands and my legs. These are external, but it starts from the heart, with all your heart and your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. So it, to, to, to keep all these commandments and the statutes which are commanded, it all starts from the heart. But if you just localize it, if you just reduce it to just the limbs, your hands and your feet, and you are just doing that external ritual, then that is not complete worship. But love the Lord with all your heart and your mind and your soul. So in, in, Act, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse... 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. This is physical or spiritual. This is spiritual. You can't circumcise the heart. In the days past, there wasn't any open heart circumcision. Not even today. Heart transplant, yes. But circumcision, no. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. For what? To love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. But if the heart is not in the worship, then you are worshipping Him in vain as we read in verse 7 earlier. So, to wrap up this, wait, before that, um, David David the psalmist recognized this. And so, in days past, he did, not ask, he did not ask for anything else, but he asked for heart transplant. And so he got it. So you find this in Psalm 51 verse 10. Psalm 51 verse 10. And he said, to God, he wrote, he sang to God, this is sound, this is singing, create in me a clean heart, O God. This man was a murderer, he was a liar, he was uh, covetous, he was a uh, uh, murderer. In one afternoon, he broke five of the Ten Commandments just by walking on the balcony. So the lesson here is, when you've got nothing else to do, don't go and walk on the balcony and look into your neighbor's roof. <laughs> and here he said, basically, my heart is really sinful. My heart is really corrupted, very bad. 
So I want a new heart. So create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. And this is a spiritual transaction. And only God can do it for you and for me. On our own, by our own effort, by David's own effort, he can never attain that clean heart. And so that was his plea and cry to the Lord, create in me a clean heart. And so must we. We should do likewise. So that out of the abundance of our heart, the mouth will speak and speak good and pleasant and righteous things that will be a blessing unto the Lord, pleasing to Him. So, before we take a break, before we end this, I want to show you this table which I have uh, uh, placed on the screen in the slides for you. So just to summarize this section about true purity, so we look on the left, man's tradition, and on the right, God's truth. And I pray that this will help you to recognize, acknowledge the difference and to know the difference and to apply so man's tradition is very outwardly. So I do this, I do that. And many religions practice this. And even Judaism. I do this, I do... I even in churches. Outward form. Because we have been doing this all these years. Our forefathers, our... Uh, whatever in the past. So we do. Likewise, we continue. But God is looking for inward faith. God's truth is from the inside. Man's tradition is likened to your bondage because you just need to do. You need to do. If you don't do, it's like you have not fulfilled the requirement. God will not be pleased. It is a bondage. But God's truth set us free. There is liberty. I choose to worship. Not that I have to worship. I choose to love Him. Not that I have to love Him. Men's traditions are trifling rules and regulation and they can be quite cumbersome, quite onerous. You are not happy to do, but you will still have to do. But God's truth, these are fundamental principles. These are fundamental principles. I mean, you instead of remembering all the do's and the don'ts, the washing, the cleansing, the pitchers, the cups, the saucers, and, and so on, just remember, out of my heart comes worship and love and praises. Oh, if that is the case, then I am not restricted by the hour and the time and the location and the position of my worship. I can worship Him in truth and in spirit anywhere, anytime, all the time. You follow me? Man's tradition is outward piety. Outward piety, more or less, is to show to others so that others can see how holy you are. But God's truth instilled in us true inward holiness. It is from the inside. It is between God and I. True inward holiness. Men's tradition, likely they will neglect the word of God they will replace the Word of God. But God's truth, we do so to exalt the Word. We do so to apply the Word because His Word is truth. And so in this table, simple table, I hope it will guide you in your walk of faith. So we take a pause here. We take a pause here. And as we do, remember whatever is in your heart must be worked out in your life. And when we return, we will look at the ministry unto the Gentiles by our Lord Jesus.